and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. In today's episode, I want to talk about cellular respiration. Oh my gosh, this is so ugly, isn't it? Don't worry, I've got some help for you. We're going to look at the big picture here. Uh, overall, the equation, you may or may not have seen it already, looks like this. Most people think about breathing when they see cellular respiration, and it's actually related. It is because of what the cells are doing that you actually need to take in oxygen and why you produce carbon dioxide. So it is related to the respiratory system. I'm going to make a lot of analogies with money because people are familiar with finances a lot more than cellular respiration. Show me the money. Oh, this is my favorite currency in the whole world. Isn't it gorgeous? That's the yellow-eyed penguin from New Zealand. Now, your options for getting money, you can either make it yourself, be the boss, or you can get it from someone else and be an employee. Okay, you're going to use this money, of course, to buy goods and services, or you can save it for the future. Now, of course, when we talk about cells, we're not talking about money. We're talking about glucose. Glucose is what cells need in order to do work. You have a couple of options. Some organisms make glucose all by themselves, and we call those organisms autotrophs. Auto means self. Now, there are a couple different ways that you can make your own carbohydrates. You can use energy from the sun. We call those organisms photoautotrophs. And some organisms use the energy from chemical bonds, which they break, in order to make carbohydrates. The other option, if you can't make it yourself, you got to get it from someone else. And those organisms we refer to as heterotrophs. Hetero just means other. Either way, you're going to use the glucose to do cell work, or you're going to store the glucose for the future. Now, what we use the glucose for is shown here. About 70% is just to stay alive. Okay, so here's the breakdown by organ. A lot of people are surprised that the liver has a bigger energy demand than the brain does. Uh, we got physical activity, and then the digestion of the food itself also requires glucose. Now, here's the thing. The use of glucose doesn't directly fuel cell processes. You need to convert it into something else first. So... You take the glucose, you run it through a series of reactions, and you convert it into ATP, and that's what cellular respiration is. My financial analogy, we have a penguin, of course, who works hard all day and wants to have some ice cream after work. He gets a paycheck. Now he takes the paycheck and goes to the ice cream truck. But you know what? The ice cream truck won't take a paycheck. They want cash, right? You can't get ice cream with a paycheck. So what the penguin has to do is, of course, go to the bank. And the bank does a conversion and gives the penguin cash money in exchange for the paycheck. And now you can take your cash and buy ice cream, right? This is not a complicated idea yet, right? So the analogy here is that the paycheck is the food that you eat, the fuel molecules that we take in. We cannot use the energy from the food directly. They have to be processed. All those nutrients get broken down and then converted mainly by organelles in the cells called mitochondria, which we're going to spend time looking at today. And then we're going to convert that energy from the food molecules into ATP. <laughs> How good are we at doing this? Well, if you take your paycheck and you go to a bank and you have the bank do the conversion, the bank should give you the exact same amount, right, as your paycheck. Uh, unless you go to one of those, you know, check cashing places where they charge fees and, and all that. You don't want to go there. The food that you eat gets converted, and you, if you had $100 worth of food, the amount of usable energy that you're going to get out of it in the form of ATP it's only about 40 bucks. So we're about 40% efficient at breaking down the energy from the food that we eat and converting it into ATP. Well, you might be wondering what happens to the rest of it, right? So you got about 60 bucks left. That energy is lost as heat in the conversion process. When you convert energy, you produce heat as a waste product. And this was actually how cellular respiration was studied in the beginning. Of course, I have to talk about the beginning. 
Antoine Lavoisier was the person who really is credited for studying cellular respiration. He studied so much stuff, it's just ridiculous. He's considered the father of modern chemistry. He studied biology. He also studied geology. He did like the first geologic maps of France, among other things. But what he did was he made a calorimeter and he used guinea pigs. And so he had an outer chamber, which he could keep at a constant temperature with, with ice. And then he had ice in the middle chamber. And then he put the guinea pig on the inside. And he found out that the guinea pig produced heat. And he collected the water from the ice melt in the middle chamber. And he weighed it. And he was able to figure out, basically, what the guinea pig was doing in respiration. And he said, it's combustion. It's just like a candle burning. Story gets a little bit more interesting. He met a woman when he was 28. Now, she was only 13. She became a scientist in her own right. But she was the daughter of a co-owner of the Femme Générale, and I apologize for my pronunciation of French. Uh, we'll get back to that in just a second. She was really important in his work, and uh, that's her right there. She's assisting him as he's looking at cellular respiration, uh, metabolic rate, basically, in humans. The story does not end well. Because of this organization that uh, his wife was involved with, he became involved. These were like the tax collectors. And these people, you know, during the revolution, all of them were executed. He was uh, tried and convicted and uh, sent to the guillotine at the age of 50. Anyway, it's, it's interesting to think about how much more he could have discovered had he uh, not been executed. By the way, the French government uh, did exonerate him one and a half years later. Here's the big picture. In our cells, we extract energy from carbohydrates through a series of reactions beginning with glycolysis. Glycolysis occurs in the cell cytoplasm, and that is going to involve nine steps, which will break glucose, a six-carbon sugar, into two molecules of pyruvate, or pyruvic acid, which are three carbons each. Those molecules of pyruvate will go into the mitochondria, and that's where we're going to spend most of our time. Mitochondria are like the energy transformers of the cell. So we're going to see, in a, in a big picture sense, how they extract energy from carbohydrates. The mitochondrion has two membranes, an outer membrane and an inner membrane, which is thrown into folds in order to increase surface area. The space inside the inner membrane is called the matrix, the mitochondrial matrix. And that's where the citric acid cycle is going to take place. There is also the space between the inner and outer membranes, and we call that space the intermembrane space, not too surprisingly. Now, the matrix, like I said, is where the citric acid cycle, it's also called the tricarboxylic acid cycle, or TCA, that's where this beautiful piece of work is going to take place. Oh, geez, don't worry. Don't worry, I'm just gonna show you the highlights of this cycle. We're not gonna look at any of the details. First thing, it's a cycle, okay? It goes round and round. The second thing is that pyruvate gets groomed. It gets chemically altered into something called acetyl-CoA before it enters the cycle. So I point this out because a lot of students, when they look at you know the order of events, glycolysis, and then the citric acid cycle, and then the electron transport chain, and they say, well, what happened to pyruvate? You know, Because pyruvate doesn't actually enter the cycle. It gets groomed, it gets chemically altered, and it turns into this thing called acetyl coenzyme A. So that's what happened to it. The third thing to notice is that bonds are being broken from these carbohydrates and the carbons which are released combine with oxygen to form carbon dioxide. And this is the source of the CO2 that you exhale. Finally, most of the high energy bonds from what was originally glucose but became pyruvate and then acetyl coenzyme A as it enters the cycle, most of those high energy bonds get oxidized, okay? And if you remember, if something gets oxidized, somebody else got to get reduced. I got a redox video. I'll put that link in the description box below. So who's getting reduced are these electron carriers. So every time you see, for example, NAD plus going to NADH, that is the addition of electrons to NAD, reducing it 
to NADH. So what's happening is that the energy from the original carbohydrate is being transferred to these electron carriers. And they are going to leave the citric acid cycle and they're going to interact with some proteins on the inner mitochondrial membrane in order to generate ATP. So here we are again in the mitochondria and you see where the citric acid cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle is occurring and pyruvate being fed in. I am not showing you all the inputs and outputs, okay? And now we're going to see where the electrons that are being carried by the electron carriers, where they go. And where they go is a series of proteins built into the inner mitochondrial membrane called the electron transport chain. Okay, so we've got NADH, FADH2, the NADs and FADs, right? They're carrying the electrons that they picked up in the citric acid cycle, and they're going to take them to the proteins in the electron transport chain up here. So the source of the electrons will be the electron carriers. And as the electron carriers give up their electrons, the electron carriers get oxidized and the proteins in the chain get reduced. So this first protein will pick up the electrons and then transfer it to this guy. And then the electrons transfer here and they kind of play a game of hot potato as it were. And as the electrons move through these different proteins, a little bit of energy is given off each time. And that energy is used to do work. And that work is to pump protons into the intermembrane space. That's what the energy gets used for. So, okay, all of these proteins have names. Um, some of them are sort of stationary. Some uh, actually are mobile. They move around. But the bottom line is what these things do is they, they have increasing electron affinity. So they want the electrons more than the protein just upstream. So the electrons are moving through these regions and a little bit of energy gets given off at various points and that energy is used to create a proton gradient. So this intermembrane space gets packed with protons. And where the electrons finally end up, the final electron acceptor after the electrons pass through all these proteins is oxygen. And that's why oxygen is needed for aerobic respiration because that's where the electrons end up. And when electrons are added to oxygen, you are going to make water. It's called metabolic water production. So I'm going to clean this up a little bit and show you the proton gradient in the intermembrane space. This is again created by the electron transport chain. Notice the direction of the gradient, that is where the protons want to go. However, that intermembrane is not permeable to protons, so they cannot pass through it. They are unhappy. And this disequilibrium is the source of the energy that we're going to use to make ATP. The analogy is a hydroelectric power plant. So this is going to be analogous to how the electron transport chain pumps protons into the intermembrane space. These protons are going to find that there is a magic space that they can fit through. They're going to flow down their gradient in the direction they want to go, just like water flows down through the turbine because of gravity. And instead of a turbine that converts that movement into electricity, we're going to have a protein called the ATP synthase, which is going to convert the energy from the protons going in the direction that they want to go into ATP. Let's go back and check this out. So here is the ATP synthase, and in the center there is a core where the protons fit. And as the protons flow in the direction of the gradient, now they're going in the direction they want to go, the cell harnesses that energy and uses it to phosphorylate ADP to make ATP. How efficient is it? Well, if you have oxygen present and you run aerobic respiration, if you break down the bonds in one molecule of glucose, you can generate up to 32, some textbooks will say 34, molecules of ATP. Compare that to anaerobic respiration. If there is no oxygen present, you stick that same glucose into the mix and what you get? Only two ATPs. So you can see how much more efficient the aerobic respiration pathway is compared to the anaerobic respiration. So aerobic respiration is like 16 times more efficient at stripping the energy from carbohydrates and converting that energy into usable ATP. 
You might imagine how back in the day, anaerobes were outcompeted by organisms that could run this new, more efficient method of extracting energy. Eukaryotic cells got much bigger, we evolved into multicellular organisms, and it just went up from there. So the overall view of cellular respiration, the inputs, glucose, and oxygen. We run glycolysis, where we split glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. You get a little bit of ATP out of that, by the way. You get two molecules of ATP just from that. And if you don't have any oxygen, that's all you get. If you do have oxygen, you can run the citric acid cycle. And again, the big deal about the citric acid cycle is this is where most of the high energy bonds from what was once glucose get broken. And where the energy goes is to reduce electron carriers. Now, where the electron carriers take their electrons is the electron transport chain. And so most of the ATP produced in aerobic respiration comes from chemiosmosis, the production of ATP using that gradient. What comes out where the atoms end up is carbon dioxide and water, and the energy from what was glucose long, long time ago gets converted into ATP. Oh my goodness, I told you it wouldn't be so painful. As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please share the love. Click those buttons. Support, like, share, subscribe. Click them all. Visit on Facebook. Follow on Twitter. Good luck.